Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, it's a little foggy and misty out today, so we can't put our equipment outside. So we kind of moved in. There's just a few of us here in the hall, and we're all sitting far apart so that, um, so that we can worship together. A um, couple of announcements um, that I've... Um, I want to share with everybody, those online as well. Um, we'll have our shoe boxes. Um, I have some here. They'll be in the front box on the porch um, at Norrisville Church and at St. Paul Church. The shoe boxes to fill for Christmas presents um, for Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. Um, so they'll be due later in, um, usually early in November. Um, so you'll have some time to do that. And it's a great project to do with kids. Our barbecue at Norrisville is next Saturday, October 3rd, from 3 to 6 in the afternoon. Um, it's a drive through so you won't get out of your car. Um, the meal is $15. Um, we ask you to bring exact change if you have it. Um, and um, we hope you can come out and, and get some good chicken and lima beans and baked potato and homemade coleslaw and a couple other things that go with the meal. Um, Hope's having um, two events um, coming up. Uh, one is a road rally next Sunday, um, and you can see Hope um, uh, Hope's website for that. Um, and also on October 14th and 15th, um, Boscov's is having a special sale day where um, if you go, you purchase something, um, you tell the, the cashier, or you can do it online too, that you want the... Um, uh, the extra to go to Hope, um, you get 20% off, Hope gets 5% um, of any, or just about anything you buy that day, um, according to the advertisements. So that's October 14th and 15th. Um, and you can do it both in person in a store and online as well. Um, for our um, Exodus series, next week we'll be talking about the Ten Commandments. Um, and that's always a favorite. I've had people over the years say, why don't you ever preach on the Ten Commandments? Well, when I do, they're never there. So, um, but uh, next week we will, so I'm giving you a, a heads up. Um, so maybe read them because there's going to be a quiz next week. And also we're going to be working on thanking our staff at our local elementary schools. Um, so um, I'm going to have some names and some um, ways to do that um, for you next week. Let's join in the call to worship. Come, let us worship God who provides for us. Even though we whine and complain, God hears our cries. Lift your voices in praise, for God has come to comfort you. Thanks be to God who forgives and heals our wounded souls. Come celebrate God's steadfast love. Open our hearts, O Lord, and let us truly listen to your words. Let's pray. God of patience, your people grow weary. We complain and question. We put you to the test. Our mouths say yes, but our deeds say no. When we wander off your path, when we fail to follow through on our good intentions, when we give our attention to trivial things, gently call us back to you. Empty our hearts of anger and pride. Empty our souls of greed and selfishness. Empty our minds of envy, doubt, and mistrust. As you poured out your very self through your beloved Son, pour your Spirit into our hearts today. Forgive us our wrongdoing. Reclaim us with your love. My friends, hear these words of forgiveness. Friends in Christ, our God is patient, steadfast, and understanding. Christ hears our cries of repentance. The Lord knows our hearts inside and out. The one who created us promises to care for us, even if we turn away. So hear these words of forgiveness. Be strengthened to walk as disciples. Trust always in God's mercy. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes to us from the 17th chapter of Exodus, the first seven verses. Um, last week's lesson was really long, kind of convoluted. Today's is much shorter. Um, and I'm thankful for that. For, from the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock from thirst? 
So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the wa rock and the water will come out of it so that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us? or not. Here ends the reading of our scripture for today. May God add understanding to us. And uh, for our children's time today, children of all ages, I brought a book called uh, No Matter What um, by Debbie Glory, uh, Gloria. And um, it's about this um, kind of a mama and baby kangaroo. Um, their names are large and small. So it can be mama and baby or anybody else and a young one. And um, it reminded me of the Israelites when I read this book um, um, because it's kind of like God and the Israelites. Even when they complained and quarreled, and you'll see the baby in this story is the complainer and the quarreler, and God still loved them no matter what. And uh, the pictures are just adorable. Small was feeling grim and grumpy. I don't know anybody that's grumpy. <clears throat> Good grief, said Large. What is the matter? I'm grim and grumpy, said Little Small, and I don't think you love me at all. Oh, Small, said Large, grumpy or not, I'll always love you no matter what. If I were a grumpy grizzly bear, would you still love me? Would you still care? Of course, said Large, bear or not, I'd always love you no matter what. If I turned into a squishy bug, would you still love me and give me a hug? Of course, said Large, bug or not, I'd always love you, no matter what. No matter what, said Small with a smile, what if I were a crocodile? I'd still hold you close and snug and tight and tuck you up in bed each night. But does love wear out? Does it break or bend? Can you fix it or patch it? Does it mend? With time together, a kiss and a smile, love can be mended with things like this. But what about when you're far away? Does your love go too, or does it stay? Look up at the stars. They're far, far away, but their light reaches us at the end of the day. It's like that we love. We may be close, we may be far, but our love still surrounds us wherever we are. The end. And that was the message that God tried and tried and tried to get to um, the Israelites for them to learn. Um, and I think it took them all 40 years in the wilderness to even begin to understand that. And sometimes it takes us just as long. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I must say it's good hearing other voices as we pray, um, because for so long now I've heard Kathleen... <laughs> <laughs> and, and myself and nobody else. And uh, so it's a good, good sound to hear. So I read the story of a woman uh, picking up her three-year-old son from preschool. And she tells of the conversation they had on their way home. Mommy, can we have a baby at our house? And she was totally caught off guard. And she stammered around until she came out with every parent's stalling answer of, well, we'll see. My girls used to say they knew that meant no when I said that. We'll see. And of course, this little boy immediately replied, how do we get a baby, mommy? And she quickly came up with a very good answer. God will give us a baby. But of course, as with any three-year-old, the questions continued. Come to my house and you'll see for sure. Mommy, where is God? And she wished she had more training in early childhood and religious education. But she came up with another good answer. God lives in your heart. In the rearview mirror, she could see him try to look under his shirt 
And he shouted, Ma, uh, he, she, he shouted, hey, God, can we have a baby at our house? And after a long pause, he informed his mother, God said yes. His mom thought she was off the hook. Um, but of course, as grandparents and parents know, there is no end to the questions. And the next day, they were once again in the car, and he asked again, Mommy, where is God? So she had had time to think about it by this point and rehearse a little in her own head and said, there is nowhere you can go that God won't be there. And God loves us so much that God wants to be with us all the time. And then she could see through the rearview mirror that he was looking from side to side in the car, like he was looking for somebody. And she finally asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for God. And she said, well, did you find him? And he said, no, mommy, God ran away. And it's a simple story that reminds us that from the most sophisticated philosophical minds to the very young and naive, in, in the matter of faith, we are all consumed by questions of what God might be like and what, we, what can we expect from God and where God is in our lives. You know, it, 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 it's, there's two questions that we ask ourselves. Is, is God the knowable, ever-present, loving parent who graciously bestows on all of God's children all their wants and desires? Hmm? Or is God the stern, judgmental, aloof sovereign who acts on whim and remains elusive even to those who are diligently pursuing their faith? I can't tell, tell you how many people um, and sometimes myself included, have said to me, I pray and pray, and, and God doesn't listen. God doesn't hear me. And it reminds me of this question that the Israelites had for Moses uh, from our story today. Is God with us or not? And this question expresses the way we feel when we realize that our, our lives don't come with an instruction book or an easy-to-follow steps to guarantee success, where we can read clearly the ways and workings of God or, or find illustrations to inform our imaginations or a step-by-step -step one, two, three guide that puts things in a doable order. Writer and priest um, Andrew Greeley puts it like this. He says, life is filled with so many senseless events. Mindless tragedies fill our news each day, plane crashes, the deaths of innocent children, terrorism, natural disasters, and so much in our lives seems without purpose and meaning, like a rainstorm during a picnic, or a bad cold that hits when something important is about to happen, or the early death of a parent or a child, or a broken marriage, or a car that won't start in the morning when we're, we're trying to get out of the house or a wrong number in the middle of the night, or the turning away of longtime friends and the envy of neighbors. We are left to wonder why things like that happen. Is there any point or purpose behind them? Are we alone in a universe that cares nothing about us? Is the Lord among us or not? Oh, this question of the thirsty Israelites doesn't stay in the pages of the Old Testament, that's for sure. It's a question for each of us today in this year of crisis. So let me back up and catch you up if you're new to this story or if you've missed a few weeks. We're in week six now of our Exodus series, the story of the Israelites escaping slavery in Egypt, led by Moses, um, into the vast empty space called Rephidim. On a, on a massive trek. Slavery in Egypt was behind them. The land of promise was their unseen destination. Preacher and writer Barbara Brown Taylor um, writes eloquently and, and, and describes the story very well. She says, it's the story that describes Israel's long and difficult journey with God. A time where they spent not 40 days in the wilderness, but 40 years, which in biblical shorthand is a long, long time. When the people were still, still working six days a week making mud bricks of the Egyptians, the wilderness looked like heaven to them. Imagine, no work, no whips, no foreign masters with foreign gods, just this clear passageway into the promised land. That's what they thought. That was before they got into it, of course. That was before the sand-coated 
um, uh, the, the sand coated them like a second skin before their lips cracked from too much sun and too much water, before they began to dream of Egypt. Like people on any difficult journey, they'd have to, they preferred to sleep straight on through it or take a Xanax and wake up in Canaan feeling all refreshed. Instead, they found themselves living out on the edge where everything is exaggerated. In the wilderness, everything, everything becomes 110% of what it is. Without all the usual background noise and distraction, there was nothing to dilute reality. All of the ordinary filters didn't work. What you see is what you get. And nine times out of ten, you get a lot more of most things than you want. And it doesn't take much to undo you and push you off the edge. Perhaps this is why the wilderness is so often a place of spiritual testing in the Bible. There is no place like the wilderness or time of crisis to put somebody's faith to test. That's what Israel learned. And that's pretty much what we're all experiencing right now. We're living in the wilderness of a pandemic, not knowing what's going to happen next, because so far in 2020, not much has happened that's good. And you all know the litany, um, COVID, racism, protests, fires, hurricanes, increasing political division. Not only has the unemployment rate gone up, but the suicide rate has gone up as well. More people are suffering from depression and anxiety and exhaustion and grieving all sorts of losses and trauma. There is no place like a wilderness to test our faith, to put us on edge, to make us disagreeable. That was Israel, and it's us too. Last week, the folks in Israel were crying out for food. This week, they're dying of thirst. And if you remember last week, they actually whined about thirst right before they didn't have food either. Um, and the water was provided for them, but it was bitter, so they whined again. And then Moses threw a piece of wood into the water, and it became sweet for all of them. So maybe you see a pattern here. The Israelites whine, and then Moses goes to God for an answer. And then God responds through Moses in some amazing way, but somehow the Israelites don't remember, and then they repeat the problem all over again. Does that sound familiar? Not to mention that the Israelites have the pillar of cloud to lead them during the day and the pillar of fire to lead them at night. But for some reason, they can't see God working in their lives. Hmm. Before we think, oh, those silly, ungrateful Jews, maybe we should stop and consider our own individual states of faith. Our faith is all too often about what we want God to do for us or how we want God to conform to our needs and our necessities in ways that make sense to us and occur on our timetable. See, we tend to measure God's faithfulness in terms of God's ability to deliver the goods. And God seems much more faithful when we're getting what we want. Like the Israelites, we don't want to stop long enough to remember what God has done in the past or consider the evidence that surrounds us of God's presence with us now. Our concerns are immediate. We want to shove the issue at hand right at God. After all, you know, if God's what God's cracked up to be, what's my little teeny problem? to the one who made all the heavens and the earth. God should be able to, to take care of it right now. We bring our desires and, and say, here's the situation, God. You solve it. And, and can you do it by tomorrow? But when our faith is perceiving long periods of silence from God, and that happens to all of us, when there's no stirring from heaven, we're apt to say, like the Israelites did, is the Lord among us or not? I want to shift gears a little bit. Up to now, I portrayed this story and the Israelites complaining pretty much in a negative light because that's what we usually do. We, we, uh, complaining is negative. And there is certainly something to be said about the Israelites and us doing all that complaining, especially now. As you know, we're full of it. But what if we stopped here to remember that crying out in the wilderness can actually be a sign of trust and faith? If we didn't think God was present, then we wouldn't cry out, would we? It takes faith to cry out to God. 
Without faith, we wouldn't bother. We'd give up. So don't be afraid to cry out or complain because God is listening. I know that we want God to answer us on our time, um, but that's not usually the way it happens. Instead, like with the Israelites, God directs us to use our faith. Uh, faith is not something we, we keep hidden in our back pocket, you know. Um, it's not, it's not hidden and unused. So when the Israelites complain and quarrel with Moses, he, first of all, he takes in reinforcements, those witnesses, those elders, so that everybody knows what's going on. And God sends him to Mount Horeb and promises, promises to stand right in front of Moses and kind of sets up the stage with Moses and the staff, you know, the staff that he had used to, to part the waters of the Nile. But the funny thing is, something different happens in this story. Um, we find out that the water is already there. They just have to find it. Now, there's always a danger in comparing the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sometimes Christians think that the Old Testament is really all about Jesus, and trust me, it is not. Um, not at all. But I want to remind you of a New Testament story that might help here. I think you all remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it's actually told six times in our four Gospels, which for us means um, it's a big red flag saying, hey, this is an important story. And each of those six times, it's told a little bit differently. You might remember what happened that day um, on the hillside with Jesus, uh, the way John tells it, because that's probably the most famous of the stories. From early in the morning, Jesus preached, and the crowd gathered around him and filled the whole hillside. And then midday came. And Jesus knew he had thousands of people there and no Panera box lunches or anything else to feed them. And Jesus came to, uh, I mean, the disciples came to Jesus and said, what, sh what should we do? How do we feed all these people? And Jesus said to the disciples, those who were so used to being Jesus' followers, Jesus said, hey, do something. You figure it out. And the disciples were stunned. They looked at each other. They weren't sure what to do. Then Andrew remembered, oh, you know, I met this little boy out there with a lunch. And they took his five loaves of bread and his two fish and distributed them to the whole crowd of 5,000 people. And they ended up with, with basketfuls of leftovers. Like in our Exodus passage, God tells Moses to use what you have. What's in your hand? You know, what's all around you? You have a staff. You have a rock. Go to it. See, God didn't create water for the Israelites just out of thin air. No, the, uh, there was already water that exists in rock formations naturally. It was just a matter of looking for it, of finding that water. Moses and God work together to find the water that's already there. In other words, it's not a miracle. It's, at least it's not the way we think of miracles. Instead, when Moses makes water appear in the middle of the desert, it's a story about God reminding people in the wilderness, what you need is already here. And that's the message we all need right now. We don't need a miracle, nothing big and flashy. We need to remember that everything we need is already here. Um, we have to work with God, not against God, but with God to see it and feel it, and let it flow into our lives. What we need is already here. For all of you here in worship um, and those watching at home, yeah, this is different, and we're still not used to it, but it works in some ways better than before um, to worship like this, to be outside, to have to move inside at the last minute because of the weather, to be online. Um, the reason it works is because we're reaching a ton more people than we ever have before who don't come here physically, who can't come here physically, but are now participating in worship. Think about the changes our schools have made. Um, and we need to take time to thank our teachers and staff because I can't imagine how difficult it is for all of them. Not only have they had to adapt to a different kind of teaching and learning, but our schools have stepped up to feed families that are in need. And we've learned to thank our essential workers for the first time instead of degrading folks who are only making minimum wage. We've, we've put them up on a pedestal um, that, that needs to happen because they are indeed essential workers. 
Um, we leave bigger tips for our servers. We check in our, on our neighbors more often. We wash our hands and wear our masks. Because our grace, our love, our thankfulness, our adaptability was already deep within us. We can change because God goes with us. And now um, uh, all of that can flow out without being a miracle because it's just what we do with God's help. And we can say to those who listen, yes, the Lord is indeed with us, even in this difficult wilderness. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, patient God, yes, we complain and we quarrel, now more than ever, it seems. But you place in our path constant reminders that we don't have to live like that. We can stand up in faith, recognizing that you provide for us in so many ways. We just have to open our eyes to your blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Folks, have any prayer concerns that you want to lift up now? Go ahead, Ruthie. Um, I put my pen. My brother Eugene and his wife okay. Kathy, they're still searching for answers. There it is. Um, from the nursing home, they, for some reason, stopped his meds. His blood sugar spiked. He went back to the hospital. He's now in the hospital, and they're ready to, to discharge him, but he has no place to go. He needs to come for our care. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. um, Right. Okay. Uh, Eugene, so Kathy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any others? So, Nicole. Yeah. What's her first name? Pat. Pat. So, Pat and family. Others? Anybody? Go ahead, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say that. So Kathleen is back. So she also has a birthday this week. So um, we're we're inside. We'll do we'll do happy birthday later. We did it um, okay. out because we were Kathleen and I were inside at St. Paul and everybody else was outside. So uh, we could do it a little bit. So we didn't sing. We just hummed. So I mentioned Joyce and Butch already. Keep them in your prayers. Um, Caleb, the little boy that we pray for um, with spina bifida, was in an accident on a, I don't know, go-kart, motor, motor um, uh, four-wheeler kind of thing last Sunday. Um, it was pretty serious. He actually lost two fingers, um, and um, uh, they were afraid it might be more of the hand or up the arm, And so, but it sounds like that's better. It, he did have a surgery scheduled um, for his spina bifida, so that's been placed, I think, put on hold or, or postponed a little bit. Uh, just a difficult time for the family. So keep them all in your prayers. Um, also, um, I received a call this week. Um, one of our neighbors that lives just down the road in the next um, the next farm owns the, the property here at the cornfield. Um, Johnny Crowell um, is um, on dialysis and needing a kidney. So his mom, Harriet, asked um, for us to keep him in prayer. And I said, well, of course we would. So um, so anyway, those are the updates that I have for now, um, and um, um, so let's, um, let's bow in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we admit we are complainers and quarrelers, and like those Israelites, we don't always see our blessings. So we cry to you, sometimes not even recognizing that we cry out of our faith in you. But you love us and call us to open our eyes and use our faith. Give us each other and and you give us little miracles um, all around us to recognize your presence in our lives. Lord, we ask for those little miracles in the West where the fires are still burning, where the air is acrid and where it's difficult to breathe. Protect those firefighters. Comfort those who have lost their homes and livelihoods. We ask for those little miracles in our nation as, as the rhetoric gets even more heated, Lord, and more divisive. And few of us are recognizing your presence in those with differing beliefs. We ask for those little miracles falling upon all those affected by this pandemic, for those who have lost loved ones and that horrible number of deaths still reaches another milestone in our nation. We ask for those miracles to be upon all families that are affected, for those, in, those that are infected and those um, recovering, for those working on the front line, for those essential workers, for those alone in hospital beds and nursing homes, for those working tirelessly on vaccines, 
for those without work or pay. Help us all to see those miracles and your presence already with us, Lord. And hear our prayers for those that we name before you now, for those who are struggling, for those who are sick and grieving, for those who are lonely and afraid. We pray for Dave and Michael and Linda, for Janice and Leanne, for Carl and Adam and Molly, for Caleb and his family, for the Greens, for Bob, Stormy and her family, for Joan and Ellen and Rita, for Charlie, uh, for Lenny, um, for Craig, for Katie and her family, for Nancy and Bill, for Joyce and Butch, for little Zachary, for Ryan and Abby and Victoria as they serve our country, for Ernest and Angela, for Gina, for Ed and Kathleen, for Johnny, for Eugene and Kathy, um, for Pat and her family, and for all those known in our hearts. Hear th these our prayers, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now let's share our blessings. Um, at, if you're at home, um, you can mail it to us at Norrisville Church or at St. Paul United Methodist Church, and both of those addresses are on norrisvillechurch.com. Um, we even have a PayPal account for Norrisville there if you'd like to use that. Um, and, uh, um, and here we'll be taking our offering as Kathleen plays. Jiggle it around. Yeah, go ahead and change that. Maybe Catherine will be there. Yeah. <laughs> well. It's got power. For those of you at home, our, our uh, keyboard is not working currently, so, all right. Are you all right? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Now, my friends, we need to work together with God. We need to remember that God's blessings are already here. And when we work with God, not against God, we can see and feel and let God's miracles flow through us into others. So go in peace, my friends, and be safe in all that you do. Amen. <laughs>